Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty Two. An old acquaintance of Oliver's, exhibiting decided marks of genius, becomes a public character in the metropolis. Upon the night when Nancy, having lulled Mr. Sykes to sleep, hurried on her self-imposed mission to Rose Maylie, there advanced towards London, by the Great North Road, two persons upon whom it is expedient that this history should bestow some attention. They were a man and woman, or perhaps they would be better described as a male and female, for the former was one of those long-limbed, knock-kneed, shambling, bony people, to whom it is difficult to assign any precise age, looking as they do, when they are yet boys, like undergrown men, and when they are almost men, like overgrown boys. The woman was young, but of a robust and hardy make, as she need have been to bear the weight of the heavy bundle which was strapped to her back. Her companion was not encumbered with much luggage, as there merely dangled from a stick which he carried over his shoulder, a small parcel wrapped in a common handkerchief, and apparently light enough. This circumstance, added to the length of his legs, which were of unusual extent, enabled him with much ease to keep some half-dozen paces in advance of his companion, to whom he occasionally turned with an impatient jerk of the head, as if reproaching her tardiness and urging her to greater exertion. Thus they had toiled along the dusty road, taking little heed of any object within sight, save when they stepped aside to allow a wider passage for the mail-coaches which were whirling out of town, until they passed through Highgate Archway, when the foremost traveller stopped and called impatiently to his companion, "'Come on, can't you? What a lazy bones you are, Charlotte!' "'He's a heavy load, I can tell you,' said the female coming up almost breathless with fatigue. "'Heavy? What are you talking about? What are you made for?' rejoined the male traveller, changing his own little bundle as he spoke to the other shoulder. "'Now oh, there you are, resting again. Well, if you ain't enough to tire anybody's patience out, I don't know what is.' "'Is it much farther?' said the woman, resting herself against a bank and looking up with the perspiration streaming from her face. "'Much farther? You're as good as there,' said the long-legged tramper, pointing out before him. "'Look there! Those are the lights of London!' "'They're a good two mile off, at least,' said the woman despondingly. "'Never mind whether they're two mile off or twenty, said Noah Claypole, for he it was. But get up and come on, or I'll kick you, and so I give you notice." As Noah's red nose grew redder with anger, and as he crossed the road while speaking, as if fully prepared to put his threat into execution, the woman rose without any further remark, and trudged onward by his side. "'Where do you mean to stop for the night, Noah?' she asked, after they had walked a few hundred yards. "'How should I know?' replied Noah whose temper had been considerably impaired by walking. "'Near, I hope,' said Charlotte. "'No, not near,' replied Mr. Claypole. "'There, not near, so don't think it.' "'Why not?' "'When I tell you that I don't mean to do a thing, that's enough, without any why or because either,' replied Mr. Claypole with dignity. "'Well, you needn't be so cross.' said his companion. A pretty thing it would be, wouldn't it, to go and stop at the very first public house outside the town, so that Sowerberry, if he come up after us, might poke in his old nose and have us taken back in a cart with handcuffs on, said Mr. Claypole in a jeering tone. No, I shall go and lose myself among the narrowest streets I can find, and not stop till we come to the very out of the wayest house I can set eyes on. God, you may thanks your stars I've got a head, for if we hadn't gone at first the wrong road o' purpose and come back across the country, you'd have been locked up hard and fast a week ago, my lady, and serve you right for being a fool. I know I ain't as cunning as you are, replied Charlotte, but don't put all the blame on me, and say I should have been locked up. You would have been, if I had been, anyway. 
"'You took the money from the till. You know you did,' said Mr. Claypole. "'I took it for you, Noah, dear,' rejoined Charlotte. "'Did I keep it?' asked Mr. Claypole. "'No. You trusted in me, and let me carry it like a deer. A and so you are,' said the lady, chucking him under the chin, and drawing her arm through his. This was indeed the case, but as it was not Mr. Claypole's habit to repose a blind and foolish confidence in anybody, it should be observed, in justice to that gentleman, that he had trusted Charlotte to this extent, in order that, if they were pursued, the money might be found on her, which would leave him an opportunity of asserting his innocence of any theft, and would greatly facilitate his chances of escape. Of course, he entered at this juncture into no explanation of his motives, and they walked on very lovingly together. In pursuance of this cautious plan, Mr. Claypole went on, without halting, until he arrived at the Angel at Islington, where he wisely judged, from the crowd of passengers and numbers of vehicles, that London began in earnest. Just pausing to observe, which appeared the most crowded streets, and consequently the most to be avoided, he crossed into St. John's Road, and was soon deep in the obscurity of the intricate and dirty ways, which, lying between Gray's Inn Lane and Smithfield, render that part of the town one of the lowest and worst that improvement has left in the midst of London. Through these streets, Noah Claypole walked, dragging Charlotte after him, now stepping into the kennel to embrace at a glance the whole external character of some small public-house, now jogging on again, as some fancied appearance induced him to believe it too public for his purpose. At length he stopped in front of one, more humble in appearance, and more dirty than any he had yet seen, and, having crossed over and surveyed it from the opposite pavement, graciously announced his intention of putting up there for the night. "'So, give us the bundle,' said Noah, unstrapping it from the woman's shoulders, and slinging it over his own, "'and don't you speak, except when you're spoke to. "'What's the name of the house? Three—what? "'Cripples,' said Charlotte. Three cripples,' repeated Noah, "'and a very good sign, too. "'Now, then, keep close at my heels and come along.' With these injunctions he pushed the rattling door with his shoulder, and entered the house, followed by his companion. There was nobody in the bar but a young Jew, who, with his two elbows on the counter, was reading a dirty newspaper. He stared very hard at Noah, and Noah stared very hard at him. If Noah had been attired in his charity boy's dress, there might have been some reason for the Jew opening his eyes so wide. But as he had discarded the coat and badge, and wore a short smock-frock over his leathers, there seemed no particular reason for his appearance exciting so much attention in a public-house. "'Is this the three cripples?' asked Noah. "'That is the dabe of this house,' replied the Jew. "'A gentleman we met on the road, coming up from the country, recommended us here,' said Noah, nudging Charlotte, perhaps to call her attention to this most ingenious device for attracting respect, and perhaps to warn her to betray no surprise. "'We want to sleep here to-night.' "'I be dot certed you cad,' said Barney, who was the attendant sprite. "'But I'll inquire. "'Show us the tap, and give us a bit of cold meat and a drop of beer while you're inquiring, will you?' said Noah. Barney complied, by ushering them into a small back room, and setting the required viands before them. Having done which, he informed the travellers that they could be lodged that night, and left the amiable couple to their refreshment. Now, this back room was immediately behind the bar, and some steps lower, so that any person connected with the house, undrawing a small curtain, which concealed a single pane of glass fixed in the wall of the last-named apartment, about five feet from its flooring, could not only look down upon any guests in the back room, without any great hazard of being observed, the glass being in a dark angle of the wall, between which and a large upright beam the observer had to thrust himself, but could, by applying his ear to the partition, 
ascertain with tolerable distinctness their subject of conversation. The landlord of the house had not withdrawn his eye from this place of espial for five minutes, and Barney had only just returned from making the communication above related, when Fagin, in the course of his evening's business, came into the bar to inquire after some of his young pupils. Hush, said Barney. Strangers in the next room. Strangers, repeated the old man in a whisper. Ah, and robins too, added Barney, from the country. But something in your way, or I've mistaked. Fagin appeared to receive this communication with great interest. Mounting a stool, he cautiously applied his eye to the pane of glass, from which secret post he could see Mr. Claypole taking cold beef from the dish and porter from the pot, and administering homeopathic doses of both to Charlotte, who sat patiently by, eating and drinking at his pleasure. Aha! he whispered, looking round to Barney. I like that fellow's looks. He'd be of use to us. He knows how to train the girl already. Don't make as much noise as a mouse, my dear, and let me hear him talk. Let me hear him. He again applied his eye to the glass, and turning his ear to the partition, listened attentively, with a subtle and eager look upon his face, that might have appertained to some old goblin. "'So I mean to be a gentleman.' said Mr. Claypole, kicking out his legs, and continuing a conversation, the commencement of which Fagin had arrived too late to hear. "'No more jolly old coffins, Charlotte, but a gentleman's life for me, and if you like, you shall be a lady.' "'I should like that well enough, dear,' replied Charlotte. "'But tools ain't to be emptied every day, and people to get clear off after it. Tills be blowed!' said Mr. Claypole. "'There's more things besides tills to be emptied.' "'What do you mean?' asked his companion. "'Pockets, women's ridicules, houses, mail-coaches, banks,' said Mr. Claypole, rising with the porter. "'But you can't do all that, dear,' said Charlotte. "'I shall look out to get into company with them as can,' replied Noah. They'll be able to make us useful some way or another. Why, you yourself are worth fifty women. I never see such a preciously sly and deceitful creature as you can be when I let you. Law, how nice it is to hear you say so! exclaimed Charlotte, imprinting a kiss upon his ugly face. There, that'll do. Don't you be too affectionate, in case I'm cross with you, said Noah, disengaging himself with great gravity. I should like to be the captain of some band, and have the whopping of them, and following them about, unbeknown to themselves. That would suit me, if there was good profit. And if we could only get in with some gentlemen of this sort, I say it would be cheap at that twenty-pound note you've got, especially as we don't very well know how to get rid of it ourselves. After expressing this opinion, Mr. Claypole looked into the porter-pot with an aspect of deep wisdom and having well shaken its contents, nodded condescendingly to Charlotte, and took a draught, wherewith he appeared greatly refreshed. He was meditating another, when the sudden opening of the door, and the appearance of a stranger, interrupted him. The stranger was Mr. Fagin, and very amiable he looked, and a very low bow he made as he advanced, and setting himself down at the nearest table, ordered something to drink of the grinning Barney. "'A pleasant night, sir, but cool for the time of year,' said Fagin, rubbing his hands. "'From the country, I see, sir.' "'How do you see that?' asked Noah Claypole. "'We have not so much dust as that in London,' replied Fagin, pointing from Noah's shoes to those of his companion, and from them to the two bundles. "'You're a sharp feller said Noah. <laughs> Only hear that, Charlotte. Why, one need be sharp in this town, my dear, replied the Jew, 
sinking his voice to a confidential whisper, "'and that's the truth.' Fagin followed up this remark by striking the side of his nose with his right forefinger, a gesture which Noah attempted to imitate, though not with complete success, in consequence of his own nose not being large enough for the purpose. However, Mr. Fagin seemed to interpret the endeavour as expressing a perfect coincidence with his opinion, and put about the liquor which Barney reappeared with in a very friendly manner. "'Good stuff, that,' observed Mr. Claypole, smacking his lips. "'Dear,' said Fagin, "'a man need be always emptying a till, or a pocket, or a woman's reticule, or a house, or a mail-coach, or a bank, if he drinks it regularly.' Mr. Claypole no sooner heard this extract from his own remarks than he fell back in his chair, and looked from the Jew to Charlotte with a countenance of ashy paleness and excessive terror. "'Don't mind me, my dear,' said Fagin, drawing his chair closer. <laughs> "'It was lucky it was only me that heard you by chance. It was very lucky it was only me.' "'I didn't take it,' stammered Noah, no longer stretching out his legs like an independent gentleman, but coiling them up as well as he could under his chair. "'He was all her doing. You have got it now, Charlotte. You know you have.' "'No matter who's got it.' "'Or who did it, my dear?' replied Fagin, glancing, nevertheless, with the hawk's eye at the girl and the two bundles. "'I'm in that way myself, and I like you for it.' "'In what way?' asked Mr. Claypole, a little recovering. "'In that way of business,' rejoined Fagin. "'And so are the people of the house.' "'You've hit the right nail upon the head, and are as safe here as you could be. "'There's not a safer place in all this town than is the cripples. "'That is, when I like to make it so. "'And I've taken a fancy to you and the young woman, so I've said the word, "'and you may make your minds easy.' Noah Claypole's mind might have been at ease after this assurance, but his body certainly was not, for he shuffled and writhed about into various uncouth positions, eyeing his new friend, meanwhile, with mingled fear and suspicion. "'I'll tell you more,' said Fagin, after he had reassured the girl by dint of friendly nods and muttered encouragements. "'I have got a friend that I think can gratify your darling wish, and put you in the right way where you can take whatever department of the business you think will suit you best at first, and be taught all the others. "'You speak as if you were in earnest,' replied Noah. "'What advantage would it be to me to be anything else?' inquired Fagin, shrugging his shoulders. "'Here, let me have a word with you outside.' "'There's no occasion to trouble ourselves to move.' said Noah, getting his legs by gradual degrees abroad again. "'She'll take the luggage upstairs the while. Charlotte, see to them bundles.' This mandate, which had been delivered with great majesty, was obeyed without the slightest demur, and Charlotte made the best of her way off with the packages, while Noah held the door open and watched her out. "'She's kept tolerably well under, ain't she?' he asked as he resumed his seat in the tone of a keeper who had tamed some wild animal. "'Quite perfect,' rejoined Fagin, clapping him on the shoulder. "'You're a genius, my dear.' "'Why, I suppose if I wasn't, I shouldn't be here,' replied Noah. "'But I say, she'll be back if you lose time.' "'Now, what do you think?' said Fagin. "'If you was to like my friend—' "'Could you do better than join him?' "'Is he in a good way of business? "'That's where it is,' responded Noah, winking one of his little eyes. "'The top of the tree employs a power of hands "'as the very best society in the profession.' 
"'Regular town maiders?' asked Mr. Claypole. "'Not a countryman among them. "'And I don't think he'd take you, even on my recommendation, "'if he didn't run rather short of assistance just now,' replied Fagin. "'Should I have to hand over?' said Noah, slapping his breeches' pocket. "'It couldn't possibly be done without,' replied Fagin, in a most decided manner. Twenty pound, though. It's a lot of money.' "'Not when it's in a note you can't get rid of,' retorted Fagin. "'Number and date taken, I suppose. Payment stopped at the bank. Ah, it's not worth much to him. It'll have to go abroad, and he couldn't sell it for a great deal in the market.' "'When could I see him?' asked Noah doubtfully. "'Tomorrow morning.' "'Where?' "'Here.' Hmm," said Noah. "What's the wages? Live like a gentleman, board and lodging, pipes and spirits free, half of all you earn and half of all the young woman earns," replied Mr. Fagin. Whether Noah Claypole, whose rapacity was none of the least comprehensive, would have acceded even to these glowing terms had he been a perfectly free agent is very doubtful. But as he recollected that, in the event of his refusal, it was in the power of his new acquaintance to give him up to justice immediately, and more unlikely things had come to pass, he gradually relented, and said he thought that would suit him. "'But you see,' observed Noah, "'as she will be able to do a good deal, I should like to take something very light.' "'A little fancy work?' suggested Fagin. "'Ah!' "'Something of that sort,' replied Noah. "'What you think would suit me now? "'Something not too trying for the strength, "'and not very dangerous, you know. "'That's the sort of thing.' "'I heard you talk of something in the spy way "'upon the others, my dear,' said Fagin. "'My friend wants somebody who would do that well, very much.' "'Why, I did mention that and I shouldn't mind turning my hand to it sometimes," rejoined Mr. Claypole slowly. "'But it wouldn't pay by itself, you know.' "'That's true,' observed the Jew, ruminating or pretending to ruminate. "'No, it might not.' "'What do you think, then?' asked Noah, anxiously regarding him. "'Something in the sneaking way, where it was pretty sure work, and not much more risk than being at home?' "'What do you think of the old ladies?' asked Fagin. "'There's a good deal of money made in snatching their bags and parcels and running round the corner. "'Don't they holler out a good deal and scratch sometimes?' asked Noah, shaking his head. "'I don't think that would answer my purpose. Ain't there any other line open?' "'Stop,' said Fagin, laying his hand on Noah's knee. "'The Kinchin Lay.' "'What's that?' demanded Mr. Claypole. "'The Kinchins, my dear,' said Fagin, "'is the young children that's sent on errands by their mothers "'with sixpences and shillings, "'and the Lay is just to take their money away. "'They've always got it ready in their hands. "'Then knock him into the kennel, and walk off very slow, as if there were nothing else the matter but a child fallen down and hurt itself. <laughs> roared Mr. Claypole, kicking up his legs in an ecstasy. Lord, that's the very thing. To be sure it is, replied Fagin. "'And you can have a few good beats chalked out in Camden Town, "'and Battle Bridge, and neighbourhoods like that, "'where they're always going errands, "'and you can upset as many kinchins as you want, "'any hour in the day!' <laughs> With this, Fagin poked Mr. Claypole in the side, "'and they joined in a burst of laughter, both long and loud. "'Well, that's all right,' said Noah, when he had recovered himself, and Charlotte had returned. 
What time tomorrow shall we say? Will ten do? asked Fagin, adding, as Mr. Claypole nodded assent, What name shall I tell my good friend? Mr. Bolter, replied Noah, who had prepared himself for such emergency. Mr. Morris Bolter. This is Mrs. Bolter. Mrs. Bolter's humble servant, said Fagin, bowing with grotesque politeness. I hope I shall know her better very shortly. Do you hear the gentleman, Charlotte? thundered Mr. Claypole. Yes, Noah, dear, replied Mrs. Bolter, extending her hand. She calls me Noah as a sort of fond way of talking, said Mr. Morris Bolter, late Claypole, turning to Fagin. Uh, you understand? Oh, yes, I understand, perfectly, replied Fagin, telling the truth for once. Good night, good night. With many adieus and good wishes, Mr. Fagin went his way. Noah Claypole, bespeaking his good lady's attention, proceeded to enlighten her relative to the arrangement he had made, with all that haughtiness and air of superiority becoming not only a member of the sterner sex, but a gentleman who appreciated the dignity of a special appointment on the kinchin lay in London and its vicinity. End of chapter 42